battled, the Imam السلام, wants to battle them. Well, you can only do that using conventional ways, where it's one-on-one -on -one combat, you know exactly who your target is, and you know exactly that no child, no woman, no civilian is being targeted here. That can only happen in conventional, traditional, old uh, uh, warfare. In, in modern warfare, that's very difficult to control your target, uh, especially you know, in, in what we see today. But the second opinion of scholars, um, the, you know, they believe that while the hadiths do talk about you know, the sword as being the weapon, however, that's symbolic because at the time, the symbol of weaponry was the sword. So when, they were t when the imams, peace be upon them, mention the sword, they do not necessarily literally mean the sword. They mean um, just, you know, whatever will be the common method of warfare at the time, this will be used by the Imam salam. And technology, by the way, is advancing such that you could control your target. Maybe one day we'll see, you know, a type of bomb being discovered where you could actually control your, your target. Only one enemy, one target, uh, is being impacted, and if there are civilians in the area, area, they will not be impacted. You know, there's work on this. This could happen one day. And, you know, we could argue that the Imam السلام, using very advanced technology could actually limit who his target is so that innocent people don't get, get killed. The literature concerning the Mahdi's arrival is explicit when describing the battles that he will fight. One tradition from Imam al-Baqir states that there will be 13 cities and tribes whose people will wage war against the Mahdi, including the people of Mecca, Syria and Basra. Unfortunately, this has meant that some people have misconstrued the Mahdi's mission, labeling him a violent, power-grabbing warlord who will simply lead his army to kill those who refuse to join him. But just how far is this a true depiction of the mission of the Mahdi? Will he rise up and govern in a way which closely resembles the various other intolerant strands of Islam that we see today? Will the Mahdi rely on the sword to ensure Islam prevails above all? نظف الأرض طهر الأرض من الظالمين لا يعود الظلم إلى الأرض بعد الإمام المهدي وبعد دولته أبدا يبقى العدل إلى يوم القيامة فلا بد من تطهير الأرض من الظالمين. Unfortunately, many in history have tried to depict a violent, negative image of the Savior of the Mahdi with the intention of discouraging people from joining him. So if you look at our hadith sources, yes, you will find narrations that claim the Mahdi will come, he will force you know, the Christians and the Jews to convert, and anyone who doesn't um, will be killed. In fact, even their pregnant women, their stomachs will be slashed and their fetuses killed. We have these violent claims unfortunately fabricated by some uh, narrators. However, upon examining and analyzing these narrations, we find that those narrators who narrated the majority of these hadiths are not trustworthy narrators. For example, we have about 50 hadiths that give us this violent picture of the Imam's government, especially when dealing with non-Muslims. 30 of these hadiths are narrated by a, by a, a person called Muhammad ibn Ali al-Kufi. Muhammad ibn Ali al-Kufi was known to be a fabricator and liar. In fact, Al-Fadl ibn Shadan, one of the companions of Imam al-Rada he prays against Muhammad ibn Ali al-Kufi. He curses him and he condemns him for his fabrications. So when you have narrators like that who are known to be fabricators or liars, we cannot trust these uh, hadiths that they're uh, narrating. These hadiths contradict the other hadiths, authentic, sahih hadiths that confirm the Mahdi 
will rule by the sunnah of the Prophet. His method will be the method of the Prophet. His method will be the method of Imam Ali, peace be upon him. He will continue that same legacy. Do we see the Prophet enforcing anyone to convert? No. The Holy Quran is very clear that there's no compulsion in faith. There were, there were Jews in Medina, the Prophet made a treaty with them. He actually signed a constitution with them. I respect you, you respect me. Don't harass us, we won't harass you. And those minorities lived peacefully with the Prophet initially until they broke the treaty. So we see the Prophet never forced any Christian or Jew to convert to the religion of Islam. Narration suggests that Islam will prevail above all under the Mahdi's reign, where the religion of Islam will become dominant. Does this mean the Mahdi will force people to convert? Will people be threatened with death if they choose not to accept Islam? كل قيم القرآن سيطبقها الإمام الحج عدي الله تعالى فرجه الشريف. فإذا كان في الآية القرآن يقول لا إكراه في الدين قد تبين الرشد من الغي خلاص الإمام الحج سيقود سيطبق هذه الآية لا إكراه في الدين لا إكراه في الدين ما سلمت الدليل أنا أنه ما حيبيد هو عنده القدرة وقبل ذلك قبل الإمام الحج الله سبحانه وتعالى عنده القدرة يعني يجبر الناس حتى يكونوا مؤمنين بس الله ما جبرهم ولن يجبرهم حتى يؤمنوا بأنفسهم طوعا ثم يوم القيامة حاسبهم The Imam عليه السلام when he reappears he will show the truth in such a clear way such that the majority of the world's population will naturally be attracted to his message. See, the reason why many people do not follow the truth is because they have not seen the clarity of the truth. Once something becomes very clear and visible for you, you accept it. Today, do you find anyone, you know, using old methods of lighting, using an oil lamp or a candle to light their house? No. We use electricity. Well, why? Is anyone forced to use electricity? Not really. You're not physically forced. But when you see electricity and the benefits of it and you compare it to a candle, no sane person will you know, resort to these old methods when you have more advanced methods, right? Same concept applies to the Imam. When people see the beauty of his message, when he calls to the oneness of God, to the beautiful teachings of the Quran, to that global, unified, just government, people will naturally follow him. So it seems that the Imam السلام, will not need to force anyone to convert or to join him. Upon seeing his beautiful message, people will naturally join. Yes, those who will stand in the way of the Imam, who will take arms up against the Imam to fight him, the Imam السلام, will confront them. But as for him invading villages and, and forcing them to convert and join him, uh, this is not something that we accept. There will be some religious minorities. There will be some Jews and Christians who choose to stay as Jews and Christians. The Imam السلام, will make a treaty with them that they will observe the rights of others and their rights will be observed. The hadith specifically states the Imam will rule the Christians according to the Bible and he will rule the Jews at the time who will stay uh, uh, Jews and they will be of course a minority because more, most people will convert willingly. He will deal with the Jews according to their Bible. He will rule them according to their Torah, uh, to their Old Testament. Due to the revival of the Sharia, the spread of justice and the overall progression of society, the health and well-being among the people will improve. The economy will flourish and the scientific and technological advancements would have surpassed the achievements of previous generations, where advancements in science and technology degenerated the culture and morality of human society, where unregulated capitalism and greed benefited the select few alone. Under the Imam, however, society will achieve the loftiest moral goals and human perfection. لما يظهر الإمام الحجة كيف سيكون الوضع؟ شوفوا هاي الرواية عند الإمام عن الإمام الصادق هذا وردت عن أكثر الأئمة عليهم السلام يقول إذا قام القائم حكم بالعدل شوفوا هاي 
انا الان شوي بعد شوي اتكلم عن القيم اتكلم عن الامور الحاكمه اذا قام القائم حكم بالعدل وارتفع في ايامه الجور وامنت به السبل واخرجت الارض بركاتها ورد كل حق ورد كل حق الى اهله ولم يبق اهل دين حتى يظهروا الاسلام ويعترفوا بالايمان اما سمعت قول الله سبحانه وتعالى يقول وله اسلم من في السماوات والارض طوعا وكرها واليه يرجعون يقول الرواية تستمر يقول ويحكم بين الناس بحكم داود وحكم محمد صلى الله عليه وآله فحينئذ تظهر الأرض كنوزها وتبدي بركاتها ولا يجد الرجل منكم يومئذ موضعا لصدقته ولا لبره لشمول الغنى جميع المؤمنين هذه في الرواية مؤشر إلى أن في زمن الإمام الحجة عبد الله تعالى فرجه الشريف في رواية ثانية يسود الأمن الاقتصادي بحيث أنك أنت إذا أردت أن تتصدق لا تجد مكان لأن تتصدق فيه فإذا الأمن اقتصادي الأمن على مستوى الشخصي حتى الروايات تقول أن الذئب والحمل يتنزهان طبعا هذه في إشارة إلى غاية الأمن الموجود وهو من الأهداف الاستراتيجية لرسالات الله عز وجل قضية الأمن إذا الأمن المقصود من الأمن الاجتماعي والأمن السياسي والأمن الاقتصادي إذا أبدا في زمن الإمام الحجة لا حاجة إلى الجريمة. طبعا هذا قد لا يتصور ويعتبر شيء خيالي بس لا لأن القرآن الكريم دقيق. حتى قبل ظهور الإمام الحجة لو أن أهل القرى آمنوا واتقوا لفتحنا عليهم بركات من السماء والأرض. هاي البركات هي المقصود منها الأمن الاجتماعي والسلم الأهلي وهاي الآن اللي قاعد تجيش الدول والأسلحة والترسانات النووية تجيش لي للضمان عليها الان كل واحد يسوي حرب يقول لك حفاظا على الامن والسلم مو هالشكل العالميه يعني. اذا في زمن الامام الحجه لا حاجه للجريمه لا حاجه لارتكاب اي نوع من انواع الظلم لان العدل يسود الدين الاسلامي اساسا جاء لتطبيق هذه القيم قيمه العدل قيمه الحريه قيمه الامن القيم التي تسالم عليها كثير من بشر وزياده في زمن الامام الحجه تتحقق إذا تحققت هذه فيبقى لا مبرر لأي شيء آخر. The Imam عليه السلام upon establishing his government will revive the teachings of the Quran and the Sharia of the religion of Islam. Now many people misunderstand what Sharia is. They have this um, negative understanding, this violent understanding of Sharia. Sharia basically means code of law. Every religion has a sharia. Judaism has its own sharia. Christianity has its own sharia. Islam has its own sharia. Sharia basically means the legal rulings, the code of conduct. You know the Ten Commandments in Judaism? That's the sharia. You know, when Prophet Musa السلام, commanded his people uh, to avoid adultery, to avoid stealing, well, that is part of their sharia, and it's also part of our sharia. People have misunderstood Sharia because of some evil practices of some uh, backward societies or some despotic governments that we see who are ruling in the name of Islam. When it comes to certain crimes, yes, you know, in Islamic law, and a murder, someone who deliberately commits an act of murder and his family does not pardon him or the judge does not pardon him, deserves a pe- death penalty. Because that's that's a deterrent. That's how you deter people uh, from coming committing acts of, of murder in society. By punishing those evildoers, you're actually protecting people. There is life in this system of retribution. نحن نحتاج أن نوضع معاني الكلمات. يعني شو الحرية؟ هذا الموضوع أصلاً في خلاف خلاف بين البشر الآن. يعني شنو الحدود الحرية؟ الآن المجتمع جاي يشتكي الان مثلا نفترض انه الان آه الخمر شرب الخمر انا حر اشرب خمر وما اشرب خمر لماذا تقيد الان شوي شوي حتى في بعض البلدان اللي قايمه ثقافتها واقتصادها على قضايا الخمر والمسكرات جاي يتشددون فيها ليش يتشددون فيها لان هاي الحريه اللي هي شخصيه امتدت لتؤثر على المجتمع فاحنا لازم نعيد صياغه الموضوع، انا في ظني ان الامام الحجه عبد الله تعالى فرجه الشريف سيعطي هاي الامور المفاهيم الوضوح الكامل بحيث انه اذا صار مثلا 
انه موضوع الزنا موضوع الزنا مشكلته مو مساله الممارسه الشخصيه مشكلته انه يؤثر على هذا المجتمع سلبا الان الامام ربما الان غايب عن الناس لان الان الان صاير نوع من الضبابيه الكثيفه حتى داخل مجتمعاتنا المسلمه حول حقائق هذه الامور في زمن الامام الحجه القران لما يقول ليظهره على الدين كله اعتقد واحده من معانيه انها تكون الامور واضحه فلسفتها حدودها واضحه لذلك مسألة الحرية تصبح نحن نقاش أيضا أي حد من الحدود الحرية الحدودية الحرية التي تنتهي كرامة الإنسان حتى وإن كان لشخصه القرآن الكريم حتى ظلم النفس لا يقبله أن تظلم نفسك الله سبحانه وتعالى لا يسمح لك بذلك لكن لأن إحنا في حالة غيبوبة الآن مو فقط نظلم أنفسنا نظلم أنفسنا ونظلم نظلم مجتمعاتنا The Imam عليه السلام will abolish usury and interest We know that today the world is based on interest. Our banking uh, sector is based on interest. The mortgage is based on interest. Pretty much every financial <laughs> aspect of our society is involving interest. Just as previous religions uh, rejected interest and usury, the whole religion of Islam also rejects interest and usury. Because in reality, while We all agree that an interest-based economic system does have its benefits. But in the end, it makes the rich richer and the poor poorer. It allows for the poor to be exploited. And it simply makes the rich richer. How do you think uh, those billionaires on Wall Street became so rich? Many of them are not really offering anything substantial to humanity. It's because they're financial brokers. They handle big financial transactions. They charge interest. They became billionaires. Many of them became billionaires not through hard work that helps humanity. It's through interest, charging interest. You know, in the religion of Islam, a farmer who toils the ground, who goes through difficulty, physical labor, to provide you a healthy meal, has a greater status in the eyes of God, and his work is more valuable than someone who's, big, who's making billions on Wall Street. Because that type of work is genuine, is genuine work, right? So the Imam السلام, recognizes, the Imam السلام, recognizes that a system based on interest and usury is not healthy to the overall global population. عندنا نص يقول يتمنى الاحياء الاموات. الان مثلا صار رفاهيه في بعض البلدان في كل البلدان مثلا في الكويت صار رفاهيه. يقول والله اتمنى انا المرحومين يجون يشوفون شلون صار وضعنا شلون معيشتنا صارت احسن. الاحياء في زمن الامام يقولون له أهل العصور الماضية بس يجون يشوفون يتحقق للناس من الإمكانات ومن الـ 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 وسائل الرفاه ما لم يكن يخطر بالهم إذا رفاهية عامة رفاهية عامة تنقل في الأرض وتعود بلاد العرب مروجا وانهارا كيف تعود كل صحاري قاحلة تعود مروجا وانهارا هاي الانهار فيها طيور فيها عصافير فيها مساكن فيها الى اخره يرى من في المشرق من في المغرب الان الى حد يرى يكلم من في المشرق في المغرب الى حد الان موجودة عندك قد يصل المجتمع بزمن الإمام إلى مجتمع لا نقد كل واحد يشتغل قربة الله ويأخذ من البياعين قربة الله حاجاته ويحاول يشتغل أكثر مما عليه ويأخذ أقل مما يحتاج In the government of the Imam the intellect of the people will be increased Now how that happens is debatable among scholars Some take it in a literal way where the Imam alayhi salam will wipe his head, his hand on the head of people, as one hadith states, 
and Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala will complete their intellect and their morality, the hadith states. Some scholars take this figuratively. The Imam السلام, through his system of education that he will present, through his system of raising awareness that he will present, the people will naturally, through knowledge, through education, will achieve a high level of understanding and intellect such that they will accept the moral compass that Imam al-Mahdi will introduce to society and they will uphold it. So we will see uh, morality in the uh, government of the Imam السلام, It will be a very moral society. You will not see any acts of immorality being uh, committed in public. Um, this will be something that the Imam does not necessarily need to enforce or ban, but people will be mature enough, responsible enough to avoid any you know, immoral scenes, any immoral acts in society. أول ما يجي الإمام لأجل الرفاهية والثراء يأمر الله الأرض فتخرج أفلاذ أكبادها ذهب الفضة يطلع من باطن الأرض فيجمعه جبلا عظيما جبل عظيم وحتى هذا مسلم صحيح يروي ثم يخطب يقول للناس تعالوا إلى ما قطعتم فيه الأرحام سفكتم الدم الحرام تعالوا ثروات الأرض تكفيكم وزيادة يعيد توزيع الثروات توزيع الأراضي حالة الرفاهية في الناس كلهم تكون حالة غير عادية One hadith indicates that all the knowledge that God has ever revealed to humanity since the time of Adam till the reappearance of the Imam is 2 out of 27. So if you were to symbolically consider knowledge 27 parts, science 27 parts, what humanity has achieved or will have achieved by that time is only 2 out of 27. The remaining 25 parts Allah will reveal to the Imam. So it will be a highly scientific society based on science, based on knowledge. That is one dominant feature in that society. Uh, inshallah, if Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala gives us the life to experience that society, one thing we can look forward to is the prevalence of science. Something that humans have never seen anything like. I mean, imagine with all our technology and advancements and breakthroughs, it's less than two out of 27. The Imam alayhi salam will uncover our scientific potential. So that's from the uh, scientific aspect. From the social and security aspect, society will be safe. The hadith indicates a woman can travel all alone from Iraq to Syria, feeling safe without anyone harassing her, anyone disturbing her. Well, that's not something that's applicable today or throughout history, especially in those parts of the world, right? So there will be safety. With the rule of the Mahdi, mankind will be witnessing an era where order and security would have prevailed to a degree like never before. It would sow the seed of hope in the hearts of mankind and remove the despair and hopelessness that had culminated following centuries of disorder, confusion and corruption. Crime will have diminished to the extent that judicial punishments would no longer need to be carried out. Mankind will be living in a state of utopia, and as narrations suggest, all the inhabitants of the heavens and the earth will be pleased with the rule of the Mahdi. However, like the Imams who preceded him, the rule of the Mahdi will inevitably come to an end. Narrations suggest he will govern for 70 years, but this will culminate with his eventual martyrdom. روايات تقول ما منا إلا مسموم أو مقتول فعدنا الروايات أغلبها تقول أنه يموت مقتولا بعضها يقول سيموت بالسم مقتول بالسم لكن استشهاد الإمام المهدي هو ليس خلو الأرض من الحجة لأن نؤمن بالرجع بل هي بداية عهد ظهور الإمام في الحقيقة بداية عهد 
بيان قدرة الله وسلطان الله وعظمة الله وجهاد الأنبياء لأغلبنا أنا ورسل كل الرسل السابقين تبدأ فترة يبين المولى عز وجل من خلال ما يطبق على يد أوليائه معنى العدل الحقيقي في الأرض قبل القيامة معنى الازدهار في الحياة معنى بناء الحضارة لذلك ظهور الإمام الحجة هو بداية لمرحلة جديدة يرفع فيها كل هذا الظلم وتبدأ سلسلة جديدة So we don't exactly know how long that will take um, This is uh, subject to the will of God Because Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala has a contingent will Factors can influence that uh, Whether it's 70 years or 300 years that the Imam will rule But it does appear that he will rule for a long time And in the end he will go back to his